Hello everyone. My name is John Poglaski. I'm a Vietnam veteran, the administrator of Cherry's website, and an acclaimed author of four award-winning books. Today I want to give everybody an idea of what it was like for an Army infantry soldier to hump the boonies during the Vietnam War. I'm not going to include mechanized units or SEALs, special forces, LERPs, recon rangers, or any similar groups because of their special operations. So, thanks for joining. Let's get started. This presentation should answer these four questions. What was it like for these young grunts to hump through the countryside while carrying a ruck stack and other supplies weighing almost as much as they did? What they carry in a bush? Was it more difficult to hump in one area of the country versus another? Did it get any easier over time? Everything you see and hear in this presentation is from my perspective. However, much of it will likely ring true for those of you who hump the bush with me. Most of us never had a permanent home. So anything personal that we wanted to keep had to be carried with us on our missions. Most everything else that was ours was stuffed into a duffel bag and stored in the supply room at the unit's base camp. You know, things like civilian clothes for R&R, &R, electronic equipment, suitcase, other personal items. In my case, Kuchi was my base camp in the south and Fubai in the north. Those items that mattered were lugged inside of a metal ammo can under our rucksack. Letters from home, writing paper and pens, wallet, money, camera, toilet paper, pictures, paperback books, magazines, and diaries were just some examples of what we wanted nearby and protected from the elements. Our rucksack and ammo can were secured to a curved aluminum frame with quick release shoulder straps and a wide strap extending across the bottom, which rested against the small of our backs. If you look at the picture, you can spot the top of the frame above the shoulder. Everyone carried a green towel draped across their shoulders. It collected sweat dripping from our heads and necks and was used to wipe salty sweat from our stinging eyes. It also made for a good cushion under the straps of our ruck frame. The first day of a mission or after a resupply was a real bitch because this is when our equipment weighed the most. Every day the weight was less as we expended supplies which were mostly food and water. Normal resupply in the bush happened about every three or four days, but sometimes had to be extended to five or six days because of poor weather or other unforeseen circumstances. This was a time when most of us ran out of food and or water and had to make do with what was available. It was also a time when everyone pitched in and shared what remained. Nobody bitched about it or hoarded anything from the group. This is a list of typical meals that are included in the case of sea rations. Some are favored, treasured like pound cake, any cans of fruit, cookies, peanut butter, crackers. Others like lima beans and ham were considered the absolute worst and sometimes buried in the jungle. In fairness to all, our squad would open the bottom of the box so no one could see the meal labels and then took turns picking a meal. Trading normally took place afterwards. Sea ration meals were responsible for most of the weight we carried. Most cans were slightly larger than a can of Campbell's soup or canned vegetables. So when you consider eating nine or 12 meals, in addition to cans of fruit, crackers, and other snacks in between each resupply, the combined volume and weight forced many of us to skimp on our meals. The next time you go grocery shop and try gathering 15 or 20 cans together in a bag to see what I mean. By cutting back, breakfast might only be a hot cocoa. 
coffee or a can of eggs, or maybe just pound cake. Lunch might be something like crackers and peanut butter, some fruit cake or a can of fruit, and then splurge in at dinner with meat, potatoes, and dessert, along with a steaming hot cup of coffee or cocoa. Near the end of my tour, we were introduced to freeze-dried lerp meals that weighed very little in comparison, but required extra water to hydrate and prepare the meals. All in all, lerp meals offered a nice variety and allowed us a different menu and weight displacement. It should also be noted here that we lost a lot of weight during our year in the war, most coming home weighing between 130 and 150 pounds. I also lost seven inches around my waist. Now that we have our meal plans for the next few days, we've got to decide how much water we need to carry. In the summer months, which were March to October, they were the most difficult for us since there was very little rain. During each resupply, we'd get a bladder of purified water dropped off, which held enough liquid to fill every canteen in the platoon. But unless I wanted to carry eight quart canteens, it wouldn't last. So we had to look for alternate drinking water to keep us hydrated. Those areas of operation that had rivers and streams were also good sources for water. Note that four quarts of water weigh about eight to 10 pounds. On average, each man carried about four quart canteens. One or two of them were usually filled with Kool-Aid or Tang orange juice, which were plentiful and shared among the troops when package arrives from home. Any water we plan to drink from sources other than resupply bladder needed to be purified with iodine tablets, and then we had to wait a couple hours before it was considered safe to drink. These were the canteens that we usually converted to one of the special drinks as taste of treated water was really terrible. You also have to look past the color of the water as none of these sources were pure as the melted snow in the Rockies. It was more of an algae green or coffee brown color. After purification, the sediment settled to the bottom. If we had to jog or move around a lot, drinking from those canteens usually caused spitting episodes because the particles snuck through our gritted teeth. During the monsoon season, there was ample water, no matter where you were in country. Craters were in abundance and usually filled with water that was 10 to 15 feet deep. We designate one for bathing and another for drinking water if we were going to work the area for a while. Banana leaves and ponchos also helped to collect rainwater during the storms, so we'd get by with just one or two canteens in our canteen cup. Now that we've covered water and food, let's add the supplies needed to fight our little war. Poncho liners, which were quilted blankets of polyester and cotton, were usually stuffed into our wrecks about that point in time and were used to keep the sea ration cans secure and cushioned. The little blanket kept us warm at night and acted as a barrier against mosquitoes. It was extremely lightweight unless wet and then it appeared to weigh about 10 pounds or more. Next, we packed two trip flares with wire and stakes a Claymore mine firing device and 50 feet of wire, as indicated in the picture here. Then we take a 100 round link of M60 ammo. Most of us draped a belt across the outside of the rucksack or draped it over a shoulder. Certain individuals also carried rolls of detonation cord and blasting caps in their rucksacks which we used to daisy chain Claymore mines or wrap around trees to create a landing zone for a medevac helicopter. This was about all we could fit into the bulging wreck. The top of the wreck sack had a drawstring that when pulled collapsed the top of the smaller diameter. We then extended the cover laid two signal flares on top, and then secured the straps to close up the pack. What you see here is a photo of the gear used on short patrols. 
the rucksack and earlier gear is in addition to this getup. Smoke grenades, baseball grenades were attached to our shoulder straps. First aid battle dressings, magazine pouches, and our canteens were attached to our belts. The fanny pack was used to carry additional supplies such as a meal, claymore mines, or additional grenades. When going out on short patrols, we'd leave our rucks behind with a small crew to guard them while they manned a day logger position until the, all the patrols returned. Each rucksack had three pockets and a side that we used to store a variety of things. Mine held several packs of cigarettes, packages of Kool-Aid, coffee, hot cocoa, sugars, powdered cream, salt, pepper, Tabasco sauce and Heinz 57 sauce from home, heat tabs, lighter fluid, snacks, and my cooking stove, which was a modified sea ration biscuit can that we punched holes into the side. The stove was used with heat tabs like Sterno or chunks of C4 explosive, which burned very hot and fast. It was great for a cup of coffee or heating up a can of spaghetti. We barely used ponchos when it rained in the bush. It was used primarily as a roof during a monsoon season or my ground cover when sleeping at night. I'd roll out my poncho into a 12 inch long cylinder and tie it to the bottom of my ruck, just underneath the ammo can. The last items to secure were a machete, folding shovel, and either a bayonet or buoy knife, and those we normally tied to the ruck or ammo belt. Finally, I'd add two cloth bandoliers of 5.56 ammo for my M16 crisscrossing them across my chest like Pancho Villa did his ammunition. Later in my tour, our scout went to the local village and purchased hammocks for us, as trees were plentiful. These usually balled up and carried in our trouser pockets or stuffed into one of the pouches on a rucksack. They were a blessing with a poncho roof during the monsoon season and kept us dry for the most part. Steel pot on my head, ruck on my back, M16 in hand, we're ready to go. Total weight about 70 pounds, which forced us to walk bent over at the waist to support the heavy load. When stopping for a short break, we'd bend over almost 90 degrees and allow the pack to rest on our backs to give our shoulders a well-deserved reprieve and allow the circulation to return. Rucks were always bobbing and shifting while humping as the soldiers tried to redistribute the weight so their arms and shoulders would not go numb from the lack of circulation. If we chose to sit during a longer break, then getting back up was a comedy of errors. We learned to rely on our buddy and pull each other up or roll onto all fours and then use a tree to pull yourself up. There really wasn't an easy way to do it. In addition to those supplies above, each squad carried an N-72 law, which was an anti-tank disposable missile, several six-volt batteries, which were used for mechanical ambushes, and that responsibility was split between the men and we switched out daily. The grunts below, which follow, didn't have to haul around claymore mines, trip flares, machetes, and signal flares because of their primary weapons they carried. Radio telephone operators, RTOs, carried a PRC-25 radio under his rucksack, which added another 25 pounds. Tucked inside, he also had two spare batteries at five pounds each in a long-range folding antenna. His total burden was still around 90 pounds. An M60 machine gunners added 26 pounds for the gun and 10 pounds of belted ammo. Usually carried a 45 caliber pistol on his belt with three additional magazines. 
However, most of us carried our pig by resting it on a shoulder and holding onto one of the fold down legs, then switching it back and forth between shoulders when one began to ache. The assist gunners carried an additional 300 to 500 rounds of ammo, which weighed about 35 pounds, in addition to his M16 and its ammo. Some of these guys also carried an extra barrel for the machine gun across the top of their wrecks. Our grenadiers, or thumpers as we call them, carried a grenade launcher that weighed about 10 pounds. They wore a vest holding 30 mixed rounds, a mixture of high explosive, white phosphorus, beehive rounds, which were like shotgun shells, and CS gas. It was estimated it weighed about 25 pounds, and he also carried extra rounds within the inside of the rucksack. Medics and corpsmen carried field bags filled with creams, ointments, pills, two IV bottles and syringes, sterile bandages, powders, foot powder, salt pills, malaria pills for every person. He issued a white one every day and an orange one on Mondays. I seen some carry no weapon with them in the field as they were conscientious objectors and others who carried pistols instead of their M16s. The S-shaped country of Vietnam has a north to south distance of 1,600 kilometers and it's about 50 kilometers wide in the narrowest point. The coastline measures 3,200 kilometers. Vietnam was divided into four zones during the war. i Corps, which is the very top of Vietnam, was bordered by the DMZ and Laos. Tukor, which included the central highlands, sandy beaches, and plateaus filled with rice paddies and bordered both Laos and Cambodia. Three Corps was comprised of gentle rolling hills and wide open areas, large urban areas, rubber plantations, and thick jungles that bordered the well-stocked Cambodian sanctuaries. This area also included a lone mountain which could be seen for miles in all directions. It was called Nui Ba Din, or we refer to it as the Black Virgin Mountain. And finally, Four Core, which was the bottom delta area, was laced with rivers and canals, often impassable for vehicles. Soldiers used a special shallow draft gunboat, floating artillery and armor transport to seek out and locate the enemy. So now the soldier was loaded up, ready to seek out the enemy. This is what he faced. i -Corps was the narrowest portion of the country, 10,000 square miles, and favored the enemy. The western portion of the zone was filled with rugged jungle-covered mountains that hid enemy supply bases and camps. East of those mountains, a narrow rolling pediment quickly gave way to a flat, wet coastal plain, much of which is covered by rice paddies and beyond, which lie beaches of the South China Sea. The Western Mountains, with enemy strongholds for much of the war, and Americans and their allies fought pitched battles against trained military forces from the North. The North Vietnamese Army, or NVA, could use artillery against Americans from both Laos and North Vietnam. Major battles included Khe San, the Battle of Wei during the Tet Offensive, Hamburger Hill and the Aishaw Valley, among others. These mountains were treacherous and at times took days to climb. I remember having to tie myself to trees at night so I wouldn't roll downhill. Climbing also took its toll on the soldiers, ranging from heat stroke and exhaustion to sprains and back injuries from falls. Tukor encompasses rugged mountains with dense forests that are broken up by rolling plateaus from Pleiku to Ban Mithau. Track vehicle movement and helicopter landings were very limited here. 
poor weather and a great distance from supply centers were important limiting factors. Enemy forces in the highlands were mainly regular North Vietnamese army soldiers. Noted major battles included Doc To, An Khe, Happy Valley, Pleiku, and Firebase Marianne, to name a few. Three Corps included Saigon in a dense countryside that was riddled with many supply routes from the Ho Chi Minh Trail and staging areas from Cambodia. It's also an area filled with hundreds of miles of tunnels, underground hospitals, and enemy staging areas. In fact, the 25th Division, main base camp in Kuchi, sat upon one of the most infamous tunnel complexes of the war not discovered until after the war ended. Usually Americans fought pitch battles against the VC and local militia fighters who blended in with the farmers during the day or worked in large cities, towns, or even in military bases during the day. After the 1968 Tet Offensive, VC units within this area were almost decimated and NVA soldiers began filtering down to the south and filling in the ranks of those operating here. Some major battles occurred in the Iron Triangle, Tainan, and Lock. And Lock. Michelin Rubber Plantation, Hobo Woods. The Black Virgin Mountain had American forces on top and on the bottom, and it was said that the middle was saturated with tunnels uh, and housed NVA and VC soldiers. There were many pitted battles fought uh, on the center post of this hill uh, between Americans and the Vietnamese army. War Zone 2 was well suited for track vehicle movement and resulted in many main force battles. Four Corps, which was the Mekong Delta, covered about 40,000 square kilometers of Vietnam. It's a low level plain, not more than three meters above sea level at any point. Most of it is crisscrossed by a maze of canals and rivers. Arms and supplies were ferried to entrench VC soldiers via sampans and other small boats. I don't know much about this area and welcome articles or commentary from those of you who lived and fought through this area. This includes the Army as well as Navy Brown Water Forces and PBR and Swift Boat Crews. The heat, humidity, monsoonal rain and groundwater meant that uniformed GIs were almost constantly drenched with water or sweat, or in this case, cooling themselves off while crossing a stream. Vietnam's wildlife posed its own dangers. American soldiers encountered malarial mosquitoes, leeches, ticks, fire ants, and 30 different kinds of venomous snakes. One historian estimates between 150 and 300 U.S. personnel died in Vietnam from the effects of a snake bite. I was bitten by a banded crank on my ring finger and wouldn't have survived had I not been pulled out of the jungle by a medevac and rushed to the 93rd evac in Long Bend. Annual rainfall is substantial in all regions and torrential in some, ranging from 47 to 118 inches. The average annual temperature is generally higher in the plains than in the mountains and plateaus. Temperatures range from a low of 41 degrees Fahrenheit in December and January, which were the coolest months, to more than 98.6 in August, the hottest month. Humidity is always high and near 100%. Jungle terrain was extremely difficult to hump through. Foliage grew so close together and thick 
that point men exhausted themselves by cutting small corridors through the dense vegetation for those following him. When cutting trails, point was rotated every half hour between three or four men. It was also a time when the soldier was most vulnerable. His entire focus was in clearing the path and not looking for enemy soldiers. You already know that we carried a lot of weight on our back to bulldoze our way through the bush. These are called wait a minute vines. They had thick thorns which latched onto rucksacks and snagged around outstretched arms, stopping us dead and then requiring a soldier to have the guy behind him unsnag him so the column could get going again. The exposed roots stuck out of the ground and caused soldiers to trip and sustain ankle or foot injuries. And then sometimes the hedgerows and bamboo thickets were so thick, only we could only create a small space and soldiers had to remove their rucks and either pushed or pulled them through while crawling through on their bellies. Now keep in mind enemy soldiers are everywhere. Booby traps are plentiful. And even in the most obscure of areas, the insects are feasting on the sweaty moving bounty. Oh, I forgot, some of this thick jungle terrain covers the mountains. So in addition to hacking a path, each soldier had to climb and then help pull up the man behind him. Humping through rice paddies was an experience in itself. They're filled with water and human waste to fertilize the rice stalks. Stepping through the thick high water and ankle deep mud was extremely difficult. The muddy bottom sucks on your boot, making it very hard to pull them up and clear to move another step. This continues until they're back on solid ground. I've heard of soldiers humping through paddies for entire days at a time. The main danger to soldiers is that they remain exposed during this time with the only protection being surrounding dikes and they may not be near one when firing starts. PC snipers often harass patrols from the nearby wood line which caused further hardship to the soldier who had to dive into the muck for cover. It's an extreme cardio workout. Open flat areas and valleys usually have head high elephant grass growing wild everywhere. This conceals everybody moving about. The stuff similar to the palm fronds that we get during Easter. The grass is almost the same texture except for the edges, which are razor sharp and have small thorns. They'll bend and move with the flow, but leave cuts on all exposed skins and are prone to serious infection. Humping through the delta meant that soldiers trudged through water and swamps for most of their day. I do know that World War II landing crafts transported patrols along the waterway to some of the solid ground to search for the enemy. It's also said that 40% of the country's population resides in the Delta area. Homes and villages are built on stilts and line the ever-present waterways. In closing, I have to say that humping was a real challenge no matter where in a country you happen to be following the guy in front of you. No one area is more favorable than the other, and each offered young soldiers opportunities to see nature at his best. In i we came upon huge caves and many waterfalls. Old church ruins in the middle of nowhere and the ancient city of Wei. In three core we discovered tunnel complexes and underground hospitals that took our breath away. We discovered beaches with pristine sand and emerald water, such as Vang Tao, which is a resort area featured in this picture. And witnessed the oddity of the Black Virgin Mountain on the landscape. 
Did it get easier over time? Some say it did, while others said no. I can attest that the first several weeks were the most difficult of my life. If you saw the movie Platoon, remember Charlie Sheen's character who passed out on his first patrol? It was kind of like that every day. We were all on a quest to reach our destination without passing out. If the word zombie would have existed back then, it may have been used to describe us at the end of the day. If we ran into the enemy, well, that's another story for another time. Looking back, I'm amazed that we were able to do what we did. In fact, I can also say honestly that I was in the best physical condition of my life during that year. No regrets. I'd do it again if I was 50 years younger. So thank you for joining me on my first ever podcast. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this presentation and look forward to reading them below in the comment section. To read and learn more about the Vietnam War and its warriors, please visit my website at cherrieswriter.com. Again, at C-H-E-R-R-I-E-S-W-R-I-T-E-R.com. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day.